Ephesians chapter number 4, you can remain seated tonight. We'll read the first 13 verses and I'll give you what the Lord laid on my heart. Uh, preacher asked me a couple weeks ago if I would to, to preach on the idea of the church. And I believe this, I want to give it to you tonight before we ever read. I want to preach on the thought of this, the challenge of unity for the church. The challenge of unity for the church. Let's read verse number 1. The Bible says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering." Forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, and who is above all and through all and in you all. But in every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men now that he ascended, which is what is it, but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that had ascended up for, uh, far above all heavens, that he might feel all things. Verse 11, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come into the unity of faith. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the opportunity. Thankful for what you've done in our hearts thus far this day, Lord. Uh, Lord, I pray God tonight, Lord, that you to hide me behind your cross. Lord, fill me from the sole of my feet to the crown of my head. Don't let me say anything that I, I shouldn't say, but help me to say every word that I should say. Help me to help hearts change lives. Mold us. Create in us a new heart, Lord, as David said, Lord. And Lord, we'll be careful to give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor, for you are worthy. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. In verse number one, I believe Paul calls the church uh, our memory. He recalls, he makes us to remind ourselves where we came from. And what a fitting song for us to hear the, the Finney family sing tonight and to be thankful. And where are we to be thankful for? What are we to be thankful for? We're to be thankful for where God's brought us from and where God's called us out of. And, and there's a lot to be said about that. But he uses the word therefore to call our minds to all that he has taught us thus far inside of the book of Ephesians. He has been writing about doctrine. Uh, the Apostle Paul has been writing about the precepts and, and also and then he writes about that of belief. Now he turns his attention to the duty, to that of practice, and then there is that of behavior. The phrase at the end of verse 1 that reads, Walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called is worthy of taking, I guess, another look or another glance before we progress to get to verse number 3 and 13, which tells us to be inside of unity. The word vocation refers to that of a calling or that of a career. It refers to a person's life's work. The calling we received from God to come to Christ by faith was not a call for a weekend getaway. It was a call to, a, to live a, a radically changed and a radically different life to the glory of God. We are called uh, to live differently because we now know Jesus Christ. Not that we know the stories of Jesus Christ or that we've heard about who He is, but that we know Him savingly and because we know Him savingly, there's been a change inside of our lives. We understand that. 2 Corinthians in 5.17 Therefore, if any man be in Christ, the Bible says he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We are changed because we're in Christ. That's what's changed inside of our lives. We are to live lives that are worthy of what we have been given inside of Christ. The word worthy means this, to balance the scales. We are to live lives that prove we belong to the Lord. As the pastor did this morning, that if we call ourselves Christians and we name the name of Christ, then there will be certain attributes about our lives that, that put off or permeate and shine as Moses' face did when he come off the mountain from meeting with God, that nobody would have to question, do we belong to the Lord or not? Having told us what God expects, us, expects of us, excuse me, Paul now moves to tells us, tell us how to bring this to pass inside of our lives. Aren't you glad that, that the Bible doesn't just tell us what to do, but it, but it also instructs us of how to do then things? Uh, Paul moves then in a, one of the clearest ways to, the church can prove the reality of what he teaches is by living the essence of what Paul talks about throughout the book of Ephesians. He mentions it in verse 3 and in verse number 13. It's the challenge of unity for the church. It's that of unity. The book of Ephesians is about God's grace. 
that reveals itself in our salvation as a part of that process. It is the very idea of unity. Let me see if I can make sense of that this, uh, this afternoon. The book of Ephesians is about God's grace, the revealed inside of our salvation. Consider the following truths then. In Ephesians chapter number 1, if you want to read with me, the Bible says in verse number 4, According as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. God's grace unites the Trinity in bringing us to God. The Father chooses us then in salvation. And in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 7, it says, In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. The Son redeems us with His own blood on the cross. And then in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 13, the Bible tells us, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The Spirit seals us for all of eternity. God's grace unites Jew and then Gentile. We would find that in chapter number 2, verses 11 through 15, if we were to read. We would see that God's grace and salvation then reconciles us back unto Him and unites us to Himself. We would continue reading in Gen uh, Ephesians chapter 2. I believe it is in verses 16 through 22 tells us that. Right? The Bible uh, would tell us in Ephesians 2 in the beginning verses that we did walk according to the prince of the power of the air. Right? It says, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and in sins. But by the time we make it to verse number 16, he says, and that he might reconcile both God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came preached peace to you which were afar off and to them that were made nigh. God is all about this idea of unity. Uh, you said, Brother Mason, I don't really understand where you're going with it tonight. Let's look at some verses then to try to help us uh, understand this better. Philippians chapter number 1 and verse number 20, uh, 27 says this, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast. Here it is, in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1 and verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Romans chapter 12 and verse number 16. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceit. What about Philippians 2 verses 1 through 4? In Philippians, he says this, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the, of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercy, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife and vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own thing, but every man also on the things of others. Second Corinthians in chapter number 13 and verse number Number 11, finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. If the Lord is that interested, church, in the unity of you and I tonight, then we should be interested in it as well. In verse number 3 of our text, in verse number 13, we are called to remind ourselves to keep in unity with one another. Verse number 3, then, of Ephesians chapter number 4 says, There is only one body and one spirit even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. Here it is. It is our text. We are called to keep or to maintain the unity of the church. I want to spend some time looking into and, and maybe talking about the challenge then of the unity of the church here. Uh, Paul says endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Several words we must uh, take a look at so we can expound upon it and uh, really grasp what it is then of unity. Endeavoring means this. Hastily or zealous. It suggests that we allow nothing to hinder us from speedily striving to secure the unity then of the church. It speaks of a holy zeal that demands a constant attention. The word keep then, this word means to guard. Notice it does not say to uh, create. We cannot ma ma manufacture. We cannot conjure up unity with inside of the church. We cannot fake this unity that Paul is speaking of. We can only protect or guard the very unity we already have. Paul calls this unity of the spirit. The phrase reminds us that the unity, the agreement, the common 
common ground that you and I find tonight within the church is not the product or the effort of us, but the product of God to make unity throughout us. This is this. We, sh- we should understand we are not to maintain this unity in the bond of peace. I'm sorry, we are to maintain this this unity in the bond of peace. The word bond refers to a band or that which binds together. Peace speaks of tranquility, of harmony, concord. The belt that binds the church together in, in unity is that of peace. So I want to talk about two things tonight. I want to talk about the witness of the plea that Paul is talking about. And then I want to get not only to the witness, but also the wisdom of the plea. If we're going to make it, church, and we're going to uh, overcome, and and we're going to be a united church, and we're going to beat the challenge of unity for the church, then we're going to have to have a a good witness and a lot of wisdom. And I believe that's what Paul tells us here. The church has no greater testimony then than when we are united in Jesus in spite of our differences. And by the same rule, there is no greater slander then against the church of Christ than when the church family in which the members are at odds with one another. And, and when we cannot be effective, and then we cannot be in agreement. And when we cannot be in agreement, then we cannot further the cause of Christ. And we, it doesn't matter how many times we present the gospel, but if they're striving and there's vainglory in it, and we're not united as one body with one mind and with the one goal in mind then then there we might as well close the doors up and and go home and look at ourselves inside of the mirror and find out what's wrong with us personally because we all are many members as the bible says in first corinthians chapter number 12 and though we may not be a foot or we may not be a hand we are of the same body and we should have the same goal in mind listen to what jesus said then in john chapter number 13 and in verse number 35 he says by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if you have love one to another he says if you know why because I bet he knew there would be a bunch of Baptists that didn't have a lot of love one for another John 17 in verse number 11 if you'll look that up and you'll read uh, here it is Jesus praying and, and the totality of it is us in Christ and Christ in us and we're in him and, and there's no division between us and he says this and now I am no more in the world but these are in the world and I come to thee holy father keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me that they may be one as we are. None greater than the other. None over the other, but equally one. That's how we should look at each other. He continues, and in verse 20 through 23, he says this, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which uh, shall believe on me through their word. And they that also may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe. Here it is, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. How would they believe that he sent him? By the unity of the very church in which he's calling. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, and they may be made perfect in one. We are a diverse bunch of people, aren't we? We are a very diverse bunch of people. We are, 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 are different one from another in every way you could possibly imagine. Uh, physical differences. I'm taller than uh, the little kids, but not the adults, right? Uh, what about intellectual difference, the economic differences, spiritual differences, uh, all, all, all completely different and against um, uh, the unity we are expected to have. But yet nothing binds us to where we come from. Because once we're in Christ, that disappears and now we are one church, right? Yet with all of our differences, there is a common ground. When we came to Jesus, the Holy Spirit took up residence then inside of our hearts. And now when the world looks at us, they can't figure out how in the world we can sit in an auditorium like this. I I, I think about it a while ago, uh, right before church, uh, Brother Charles and I were having a conversation. And and the mentality today is that that if Brother Charles was to walk up to an individual and invite an individual to church, they would automatically assume that that he attends, and a, 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 they would racially profile that church and, and then say that uh, I assume that Charles goes to an, maybe an all-black church. Or, or if I invite an individual, they would assume that, that the church house is filled then with, with, the, with the predominantly white individuals. Why? Because mm, that's what gravitates. But, but all that goes out of the window. And then when we walk through the doors, there is no, there is no age difference that separates us. There are, there are no economic differences. There are, there are no background differences. And hey, inside of the same auditorium, sits a drunkard, an ex-drunkard, an alcoholic, and, and they can still have a good influence on anybody. Why? Because of the spirit that binds us one to another. Because that's what's inside of the body. When he is in you and he's in me, he can cause us to move past our differences, to walk together in unity for the glory of God. Now we can say with Paul, as Paul did in Colossians chapter number 3, verses 11 through 15, he says, 
There is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on therefore all the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also ye are called into one body. And be you thankful. Amen. Hold no grudges. Yeah, yeah. You ever wonder, you ever, you ever stop and say, man, they better be lucky I'm saved. I've said that before. You know, you're like, back in the day, hey, I would have, I would have. No, God changed us. God's moldness, God's working on us. And we're not who we used to be. Therefore, we don't lash out. We have meekness. And, and, we, and we tried to dwell together inside of unity, the collective body. I was, told, I was telling the uh, Sunday school class this morning when we were talking about giving to the Lord and what if God were to cut us off? Hey, if, we, if we don't give to God and, and inside of times, I know this is going out there in left field for a second, but, but what if God, God said, hey, well, I'm not going to let you use your legs today. I'm not going to let you use but 50% of capacity of your body. Since you only wanted to give me X amount of dollars and you couldn't tithe, what if God put you in a wheelchair for two months? He'd have a right to do so. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, Job said. Blessed be the name of the Lord. When we are at war one with another, we have lost our testimony then with the world, the very individuals we are trying to reach. When we walk out of unity, we are telling them that we are no different then, yeah, than right. they are. Yes, how, how silly do we look trying to reach the world acting just like they act, acting dysfunctioned just like they act, when we call ourselves brothers and sisters in Christ and, and we go sideways because somebody didn't shake our hand when we come to church or because somebody had, might have had a bad day, we had no clue what they were going through, but, but we're to dwell in unity and the whole time, the next two or three services, all we're thinking about is, is they didn't come up to me. No, no, God says junk all of that and dwell in unity. Yeah. Dwell in Unity. The world cannot find peace because they have no uh, ground for peace. We are to be different. The Spirit of God dwells inside of every true believer to guide, to direct, and cause us to produce the very fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians 5, and verses 22 through 23, which always leads to peace within the church. When we walk in peace, we have given, uh, given over to the Spirit wholly. We magnify the Lord Jesus and show the world that there is something different than about us. You want to you act different? You want to show the world that you've been changed? Dwell in unity. Dwell in peace. In verse 2, Paul speaks about hum, uh, humility then. Gentleness, patience, and the love and tolerance. Every one of the, these spiritual char characteristics flows out of the genuine love one for, for another. Every one of them comes from the, from the presence of the Holy Spirit within our hearts. We as believers need to know that, that God's will for His people is that we walk in unity and pull in this, uh, uh, and, and pull in this same way for the glory of the same God. That there are no divisions. That we're, we're, not, we're not taking different routes to, to get to the, to the goal. Paul said, I press toward the mark. There's one mark. There's one way. There's, there's one God. There's one Lord. There's one Bible. There's one way to do it. Not all these multiplicity of ways that, that it, once we get us out of the way and we, we fall in line with the Bible and we fall in line with, with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and we, we dwell together in unity. Matter of fact, I want you to do this. I want to take your right foot, stand up, and run to this side of the wall. Take your left foot and run that way. It's impossible. Your body's not going to let you do it. MJ probably could, but that's the only one in here I know could. We've got to, we've got to understand this. It's going to take a witness. And the world, when they look at us, if you want to be effective, we must dwell in unity. Not only dwell in unity, the challenge, of, uh, the challenge that we'll face for this plea of, of of unity. It's not just wisdom. Not just, I'm sorry, witness, but it's also wisdom. Walking in unity does not mean that we always have the same ideas about the same issues. We may have differences of opinion from time to time. This is both healthy, I believe, and, and good. It, it helps us to grow. Uh, there needs to be a, a diversity of thought and not an intellectual or a, a spiritual totalitarianism that, that dictates the, what every single person is allowed to, to think or believe, right? Walking in unity does not mean that we always believe exactly the same thing about every same issue, right? It does not mean that we lose our individuality of who we are when, when we're saved. It doesn't mean that we're automatically at the same level spiritually and at salvation as everybody else in the congregation. It doesn't mean that we're uh, able to completely change overnight. However, it does mean this. 
this. It does mean that we are marked by a common purpose to lead, uh, to lead by a common Savior. It does mean that we are uh, to give over wholly to the Lord. It, it gives us clear direction and that we are put aside for personal, uh, to put aside our personal opinions and walk together for the glory of God and for the very good of the gospel that God's called us to present. It does mean that the unity of the church is more important than me getting my own way or you getting your own way. It does mean that the unity of the church always comes ahead of my personal agenda and it does mean that the unity of the church comes before my feelings, it comes before my family, and it always comes before my pride. The unity of the church. Nothing shows the world that we are different from them in our walk any more than that of our being different in this specific area. When they see us at odds, we can forget the gospel because we will not reach them for the cause of Christ. But when they see us walking in unity as it is manifested in true humility and that of, I believe, of gentleness and uh, toward one to another, patience, endurance, and uh, uh, with one another and love and tolerance for our differences, it will do more to reach the world than any outreach program ever could because they see us uh, from, from vast differences. And they can't fathom it. They cannot fathom how we can sit under the same roof tonight. Be from all the same different, different multiplicity of backgrounds. The, the things people have been through, the things people have done, the world can't contemplate it. They can't fathom what's going on inside of a church like this tonight. I read this while I was trying to read and study. It says uh, a man, Chuck uh, Colson, in his book, The Body, says this about John Calvin. Calvin, who saw the devil's chief device was disunity and division in whose preaching that there should be friendly fellowship for all ministers of Christ, made a similar point in a letter to trusted colleagues. Among Christians, there ought to be so great a dislike of schism that they may also avoid it so fast as a lie in their power that there ought to be prevailing among them that are such reverence for the ministers of the word and the sacraments that wherever the, they perceive these things to be, there they must consider the church to exist. Nor need it be any hindrance that some points of the doctrine are not quite so pure, seeing that there is scarcely any church which has not retained some remnant of former ignorance. Calvin was simply reminding us that we are all wrong at some point and that we must change. If that's our practical life, it's that our theology, whatever it is for the unity of Christ, we are to change. If we are right about Jesus Christ and the gospel, that is common ground, right? It's wrong for, for there to be divisions among you and me just because we disagree on, on what kind of car we should drive. That sounds crazy, right? Or political backgrounds. You, you would be surprised that the individuals that, that claim the name of Christ, but when it comes to political grounds, they will, they will bump heads and they won't see eye to eye at all. And they'll quit talking. But that's not how we are to be. I'll close with this tonight. In the 17th century, an archbishop by the name of Marco Antonio de Ominis wrote this. In necessarius untus, in dubious libertus, in omnibus caritas. This is the Latin phrase roughly translated to this. In necessary things unity. In uncertain things liberty. In everything charity. That little saying speaks volumes, I believe. There are some truths that might be defended to death. Even at the very cost of unity, right? There are some things that are open to interpretation. We are to give liberty to others in those areas and not judge them for their actions or beliefs in everything whether we can stand together or whether we must separate over our differences, every action then is to be motivated by the love of Christ in us for other people to dwell in unity. As a conclusion, church, as a church, we have seen, I imagine, our share of disunity, dysfunction. Maybe we have been a part of this dysfunction, this disunity. I'd like to ask two questions. Sister Amber, make our way to the piano tonight. I'll ask these two questions. Am I a reason for disunity amongst my fellow believers? And number two, am I doing what it takes to maintain the unity of this local assembly? Number one, am I a reason for disunity amongst my fellow believers? And number two, ask yourself tonight, am I doing what it takes to maintain the unity of this local assembly? We didn't celebrate the years we celebrated today for pizza parties. It wasn't puppets, it wasn't putt-putt, it wasn't family and friend day, it was unity. Doctrine and unity.
Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father.